This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In 1606, the Archdukes of Vienna declared of their ruler, His Majesty is interested only in wizards, alchemists, cabalists and the like, sparing no expense to find all kinds of treasures, learn secrets and use scandalous ways of harming his enemies. He also has a whole library of magic books. He strives all the time to eliminate God completely, so that he may in future serve a different master. The subject of this attack was the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II and his court at Prague. Rudolf had filled Prague with the wonders of the age. The great paintings of Italy were carried over the Alps, intricate automatons constructed, maps and models of the heavens unfurled and engineered. But Rudolf's greatest possessions were people, the astronomers Johannes Kepler and Tycho Brahe, the magus John Dee and the philosopher Giordano Bruni had all found their way to his city. Far from the devilish inquisitor of the Archduke's imagination, Rudolf patronised a powerhouse of Renaissance ideas. With me to discuss the court of Rudolf II, a Howard Hodgson, lecturer in modern history at the University of Oxford, Adam Mosley, lecturer in the Department of History at Swansea University, and Peter Forshaw, postdoctoral fellow at Birkbeck, Uni- at Birkbeck University of London. Peter Forshaw, uh, the Archduke of Austria made it very clear that Rudolf was an intellectually curious man, a pursuer of secrets. Can you explain broadly what sort of secrets he would have been pursuing? Um, I have to say, almost everything, really. But one Venetian um, visitor observed that he's anyone who can give him knowledge of secrets of natural and artificial things will gain his ear. Uh, by natural, that's the three kingdoms of animal, vegetable, and mineral. Um, and artificial can be artistic creations, but also uh, mechanical objects, scientific instruments, and so forth. Um, particularly to do with, really, the celestial and terrestrial. On the terrestrial level, the science particularly of alchemy, and obviously with the celestial astronomy. They're pretty tough, aren't they, with the business of wizards, alchemists, cabalists, uh, scandalous ways of... How true is all that? Um, There's no doubt that, really, Prague was the magnet for anyone uh, who was a practitioner of of the uh, occult arts. So alchemists really knew that Rudolf was a grand patron of, of, of alchemy. At, at, his, at the heyday, at the height of his interest in alchemy, 200 alchemists and their assistants were working in the laboratories at the palace in Prague. Can you just address this business of alchemy for, for a moment, Peter? Because we're at the height of the, of the in, intellectual interest and belief in and pursuit yes. of uh, alchemical. So just tell us how, how important that was to learning at the time. So learning, extremely important. It wasn't yet a university-based discipline. That wasn't until 1609, the first pro- professor of chemical medicine in uh, Marburg, University of Marburg, that financed by and funded by another aristocrat who was interested in alchemy. But intellectually, natural philosophers were increasingly seeking both um, knowledge on a theoretical level, but practical level as well, so laboratories. And it's fascinating that someone like Rudolf, the emperor, the most powerful aristocrat in the Christian world, himself did alchemy, which raises the status of it from from just being a a sort of craft that people did uh, and dirty themselves in laboratory. He actually performs this himself and and really increases the stature. So this is this is a way to discover the deepest secrets of life. Very That's much what so. they're talking yes, about. Yeah. That's what the pursuit of. And he's the, got two hundred yes. of them, but he's in this discipline alone. Yeah, in in Prague, uh, and, and many visitors as well coming. I mean, these were just people who were based there. Um, his second in command, the, the potentate of South Bohemia, Willem Rosenberg, was also another great patron of alchemists. So this is two hundred alchemists, and he's got. I presume he's got hundreds of others in the other disciplines. Is is pursuing? Uh, yeah, many other. I yeah. mean, astronomers. I don't know about hundreds with astronomy. It's not my area, but. Yeah. He had some of the most famous astronomers you could ever get. Can you tell us about one or two of the... Well, one thing, before we... Just to give one example, the Voynich Manuscript, which you had. Okay. Now, why is that... That's just one example of the things he collected. We'll get to his collections yes, in a moment, yeah. too. But that is an interesting one to give us a specific example. That's an interesting one, and, and amazing, I suppose the most notorious one, really. Um, 
all that we know is, I mean, this was a manuscript that was rediscovered, as it were, in the early 20th century by an antiquarian book dealer. Um, attached to it, and it's a cipher manuscript, it's a manuscript we do not know how to interpret it. It's written in, in the scripts that no one has ever cracked, even though people at Bletchley tried to crack it, actually. Uh, it's also illustrated with incredible, well, diagrams, herbal diagrams, astrological and cosmological diagrams, lots of naked ladies, I have to say, as well, uh, all adding to the attraction of it. Uh, and supposedly, it's, it, well, it might have been created by the 13th century English natural philosopher Roger Bacon. There are rumours or suggestions maybe it had gone through the hands of John Dee. Um, certainly the account is there was a letter attached to this saying that the Emperor Rudolph had paid 600 ducats for it, which is a huge amount of gold at the time. Um, Athanasius Kircher, the 17th century polymath who was really into the occult, was sent, a cop sent it uh, and was asked to try and translate it, though we don't know if he had any success. So a very mysterious manuscript purporting to be about the secrets of the natural world. Still untranslated? Still untranslated. It's in the Yale um, University Beinecker Library now, and books have been written about it, but still, no, not cracked. Howard Hodson, in 1583, Rudolf left Vienna, at the traditional seat of government, and moved his court, his imperial court, to Prague. What kind of statement was that? Why did he want to go there, and what was he saying? Well, like, there's so many aspects of Rudolphine culture. There are a couple of different levels here. I mean, there's a pragmatic military level. The fact that the uh, one of Rudolph's many responsibilities was act as king of Hungary, or what was left of Hungary after the Ottomans had, had swallowed up most of it and brought the, the border between the Christian and the Muslim world to within 100 miles of the gates of Vienna. So moving out of that particular neighborhood had some, had some obvious <laughs> practical uh, advantages to it. There's a, there's, a, there's a political and dynastic uh, question here, too, because another of his responsibilities was as head of the, uh, head of the Habsburg family, and therefore in some respect, supreme authority over uh, the Austrian patrimonial lands, but they were not a consolidated mo monarchy. It was a, it was a hodgepodge, a, uh, a uh, jigsaw of, uh, of, of, of individual territory, some of which he, he ruled directly, some of which were ruled by younger members of his, his family, which was a recipe for a great deal of sibling rivalry, which eventually unseated Rudolf completely. And to put, get, get some distance from that was, was also beneficial politically. But the most interesting dimension, I I think is the religious one, which one could which one could formulate sort of paradoxically by saying he was attracted to Prague because it was a associated with an ancient and successful heresy, the one the Hussite uh, Reformation, the one great medieval uh, heretical movement which had actually succeeded, which had which had which had persevered a uh, hundred years before Luther, hundred years were. before hundred years before Luther, sort of paving the way in some respects uh, for for the Reformation. Um, successfully defying the uh, authority of the Church of Rome, and also to some extent inoculating uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Bohemian kingdom against the uh, religious development which was most difficult for a, a whole series of uh, subsequent Habsburg emperors uh, to deal with and really culminated in the era uh, of, of uh, Rudolf II, which is this process of confessionalization, the, very, the, the, um, the dissolution of, of some kind of comprehensive, uh, moderate, broad, um, consensual uh, ecclesiastical uh, settlement to... Um, a very rigid definition of the post-Tridentine Catholic Church over against Protestantism and the very very rigid definition of Lutheranism over against Calvinism and the, and the dissolution of a, a medieval uh, Christendom into uh, three uh, increasingly a, 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 um, antagonistic confessional communities. Difficult enough uh, in other parts of Europe, but particularly difficult because all three of these are now well established in um, in uh, the Holy Roman Empire, and uh, uh, his, 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 his highest um, uh, responsibility was not merely being King of Hungary, King of Bohemia, and Archduke of Austria, but also being the Holy Roman Empire, and therefore responsible for, for, for keeping the peace. The fact that, uh, the fact that um, in Bohemia, this earlier religious development had some, in, in some respects kind of inoculated uh, uh, the population against um, the radicalization which was going on elsewhere was, in fact, a very a rather foresighted and, and, and an ingenious solution to an otherwise intractable problem for, for Rudolf. So it was, a, it was a heretical place to go to. It forced him to be tolerant, and we're told that, that, that the difference 
sorts of Protestantism and Roman Catholicism and the Jewish faith were, were tolerated because he had to. In fact, he's one of his biggest friends and backers in Prague was uh, a, a Jewish merchant. Uh, and there we are with that. I just want to tell listeners, we're putting aside the fact that he had a, a, a long and rather unsuccessful war against the Turks, that he's supposed to, after his death, six years after his death, the Thirty Years' War started, which a lot of people, some people still say was his responsibility, and that his brothers ganged up against him and stripped him of most of his status to audience. That's to one side. Mm -hmm. That is perhaps mm -hmm. for future uh, <laughs> delectation. Uh, right. Adam Mosley, one of the areas in which Rudolf's court would leave a lasting imprint was astronomy. So can you tell us about the state of astronomy at the time, at the time he moved to Prague? Well, in the later 16th century, astronomy was in a very interesting place because there were available to astronomers two systems of modelling and calculating planetary positions, the ancient geocentric system of Ptolemy and the new heliocentric sun-centred system of Copernicus. These were mathematical systems. They uh, utilised combinations of circles to stipulate where the planets would be at any given moment. Um, both systems were philosophically problematic and that uh, created opportunities but also difficulties for those who were working with them. Ptolemy's system was often taken to be the uh, mathematical equivalent of the philosophy, the model of the cosmos handed down from antiquity, uh, from Aristotle, which placed the Earth at the centre of the universe. But there w it didn't quite, didn't quite mesh. And so there was a traditional way of dealing with this problem, which was to say that astronomers were really only in the business of providing useful models. And it was really the philosophers who could tell you how the universe really was. And this, of course, informed the way in which people responded to the Copernicus system, the, the Copernican model, with some people trying to say, well, this is a mathematically useful model. Let's reconvert it to make it philosophically compatible with our knowledge, which is that the Earth is at the centre of the universe. As I understand it, somebody who wrote the preface, I've forgotten the name now, uh, uh, to this, uh, uh, got it through, because, of course, it was heretical, uh, got it through by saying, look, he is not saying that the Earth is no longer the centre of the universe. This is a very interesting, what I'd say we call a thought experiment, the better to understand how things work, so don't get worried about it. Well, let's be clear, it wasn't heretical until 1616 when the Catholic Church condemned the Copernican theory. So why did they have to disguise it if they were f not fearful about it? Oh, well, there was certainly con anxiety about it. Um, anxiety about... But it wasn't strictly heretical. It wasn't strictly, really? it wasn't strictly heretical, no. And we can thank partly Galileo Galilei for um, pressing the issue in such a way that the Catholic Church felt forced to respond. But certainly there was a concern about it. There was a concern about how it could be made compatible with Scripture. Um, because there are passages in scripture that strongly seem to imply that the earth is stable at the centre of the universe. So, a, in fact, a Lutheran, Andreas Osiander, wrote an uh, anonymous preface in which he said, look, don't worry about you know, the disturbing contents of this book. The job of the mathematician, the astronomer, is simply to provide mathematical models. You don't need to take this as an account of how the universe is really structured. So it's in a very interesting state. That collecting itself is also... The, this is the last generalisation before we home in on, on... Collecting itself is changing at this period. And can you tell us how it's collecting and how Rudolf fits into that? Perhaps is one of the agents of change. The great princely collections of the medieval ages were typically treasuries. So they would be um, gold, silver, precious objects in strong rooms. Um, but during the Renaissance... Um, coming into the 16th century, the range of objects that princes collected expanded, and the, the ways in which these objects were displayed expanded. So there was much more of a tendency to want to display objects in situ, and there was a tendency to collect a much wider range, natural objects, specimens, exotic plants and animals, uh, works of art, uh, antiquities, coins, medals. Objects that, as well as being precious and valuable, could also be seen as representing, contributing to knowledge in a, one form or another. 
Peter, for, for, mm. for sure, one of the collections, or two of the collections, is a Cabinet of Curiosity and a Cabinet of Wonders, which yeah. you, if you were... If you're a polite enough or acceptable ambassador, you got to see. And if yes. It, it, one way to snub you is not, he, he wouldn't show you his collections. Yeah, yeah. What were in these cabinets of wonders, and why were they important? Um, Adam dwelt in it a little bit, but could you yeah, do yeah. that? Um, I mean, Rudolf's, okay, got scientific uh, or natural philosoph philosophical and occult interests. So um, there, are, there are various ideas about it. One is that this is his microcosm. He's collecting specimens of all the natural world. So, for example, uh, he's, uh, and they're not just sort of uh, minerals, they're uh, inanimates. They're also, he's got his menagerie, he's got his um, collections of animals, including even a dodo, for example. Uh, he's got his botanical gardens. Um, and these, they're not just sweet-smelling flowers, though I'm sure many were, but they've, they've got healing virtues, occult virtues um, for medicines. Um, but also, for example, he had supposedly 37 cabinets of minerals alone. And these, they work on different levels. There's the antiquarian value to them. There's the artistic value. There's the fact that they're talismanic, many of them, so they've got magical healing properties or, or other properties preserving you against demons and so forth. But he also has um, a unicorn horn, for example, um, he's got, in theory, phoenix feathers. He's got um, unusual things like, um, I think, nails of Noah's Ark. What even. were the principles behind this? I mean, would like, anyone like to take us up? Do you like to take us up? Uh, well, um, one of what the was the organising <coughs> principle? Well, one, one, of, one of the interesting things about these co collections, which really differentiates them from museums as we know them today, is, is, is the tendency to collect, collect natural objects, naturally on the one hand, yeah, and, yeah. and artificial objects, art, uh, artificially on the other hand, mm -hmm. and, and, and to bring these together, and as it were, to, to merge the world of, of human artifice and, uh, 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 and on the one hand and the world of sort of divine creation on the other, and almost yeah. as it were, to blur the boundaries between these. This is one of the most fascinating and almost disturbing aspects of these collections, the way in which so many of the objects, um, the, the fascination derives from the way in which they blur this boundary. I mean, the, the automata, for instance, which are designed to replicate the movements, the sounds of living things, even though they're mechanical. Yeah. And uh, I There are many, I think there are many instances, particularly with Rudolf's collection, where, yes, it's the, it's the bringing together the intersection of the natural and the artificial. So, for example, things like the agate basin that you would look into and Christ was written into the stone mm -hmm. as if by nature. That's you know, nature imitating a human activity of writing. But uh, things like uh, uh, goblets made of ostrich eggs, those kinds of things where you take a natural object, you add to it in a way. Or indeed the, the, the pictures, the um, landscapes that were constructed from polished stone. So this is a, an artwork representing a natural place made from natural materials, these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, before you come in, I'd like to get at it from, uh, before we move on. Mm. These, are the, these are there to help study, aren't they? Mm. Yeah, these, are, these all in the per are these all serving the purpose of, of going through the occult to get to, to more knowledge? This is why they're all there. Mm. It's just that he yeah. doesn't fancy it, just that he... Away you go. Yeah, uh, Okay, it's, they are for study, they are for private reflection. I, I mean, on another level, they're propaganda, um, they're expressions of imperial power, um, but, but definitely they are for study. I mean, um, Rudolf tried his best to attract um, the greatest magical uh, philosopher of his time, well, natural magic, um, the philosopher of natural magic, uh, Giov Giovanni Battista della Porta, from Naples. Um, and it's interesting that della Porta, one of his best friends, was um, Ferrante Imperato, who had a very important collection, again, of um, curiosities and wonders. Uh, and one of the most famous uh, maguses of the time, Tommaso Campanella, said this collection is really important because through it we can get to the reason and the laws of natural magic. So they're not just there as... They are there for their symbolic value, but they're, the symbolically it's the knowledge that can be dis gained from them. Uh, and the utility, I have to say, quite a utilitarian value. Um, it's not just things to be admired and adored, but they can be put to practical use. And I think, as with the uh, alchemy, for example, there's a very strong utilitarian streak to Rudolf's connection, which is different from universities. Howard, Howard Hobson, uh, he was also a patron of the arts. We were told he had about three, more than 3,000 paintings he collected. It was one of the great... Well, greatest uh, Renaissance art collections. What kind of taste did it show him as having? What, 
Well, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's several different uh, dimensions to his, his, his collecting. I mean, the one most famous, perhaps, is his, uh, his collection of, of, of paintings which have been commissioned uh, by artists either in his court or at other courts, which he'd been unable to prize loose from, uh, from the clutches of, uh, of other uh, patrons elsewhere. Uh, in, in the contemporary international style of mannerism, uh, um, he, 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 had, uh, which I think we'll perhaps talk about a bit later in, in, in more detail. Um, another thing he's very interested in is, is collecting uh, um, major artworks collect, uh, patronized by earlier members of the Habsburg dynasty, and, and uh, Albrecht Dürer is a particularly good example, who was mm-hmm. the favorite court art, artist of Maximilian I, uh, his great great grandfather. Um, but also from the from the Netherlands. I mean, Pieter Bruegel, the uh, the younger, was was uh, he had something like ten of his paintings, which is a it's very substantial uh, 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 proportion of his of, of his work. So it's it's comprehensive on the one hand, but it's 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 imperial it's imperial on the other, and it's focused on this very late Renaissance uh, development of mannerism, which is, as it were, pushing, pushing past the aesthetic standards of the, of the high Renaissance in, into genuinely new territory, and, and yeah. territory which overlaps in some respects with the, with the occult preoccupations of, of the court, court as well. The artist not merely, again, as the imitator of nature, but, but with, a, with a creative power to realize his own vision, which in, in some respects goes parallel to, to that of, of, of the alchemist and some of these other occult disciplines as well. So we can say at this stage in the program, Adam, that there in Prague you had this, this quite enormous collection, and, and even so we've only just touched on it. Mm. It's vast, and people are attracted to it. He's bringing them in because his biggest collection is of people. Uh, he's bringing in scholars, he's, he's in the field, he's getting <laughs> transferred across to him all the time. His, his agents are looking for them as well as they're looking for objects. Can you give us a, <coughs> can you give us a sense of the, of, the, of the people who began to come in early? Who was he after? Well, if we say that Rudolf collected people, which I think is absolutely right, um, we have to recognize that, of course, he inherited some of his c- collection in terms of objects and people from his predecessors, Habsburg. So people like Giuseppe Archimboldo, who's one of the artists mm. who associated very strongly with Rudolf... He made a portrait in Rudolf from fruit and flowers. <laughs> That's right, yes. yes. Mm. Uh, an image of Rudolf as uh, the god Vertumnus. Mm. Um, now, that's a very interesting painting because it fits with a whole set of earlier paintings that um, uh, Archimboldo produced for um, Maximilian II that are, again, they're very, they look very jokey. They mix the natural and the human. They're, they're portraits made up of animals or objects where the head is made up of an assemblage of, of objects. But these uh, these uh, images um, would have come with a set of came with a set of interpretive descriptions and poems, which make it clear that these are um, allegories of imperial power, and that I think is quite important for understanding how um, people come to be collected, because in in relation to the collections of objects. Princes like Rudolf need scholars, they need artists not only to produce objects for their collections, but also to manage their collections, to interpret their collections, uh, to participate in the display. And that also connects to the kind of pageants and festivals that we see in the courtly context, where the same people, people like Archimboldo, were responsible for managing these, for devising these, for picking out the classical themes that would be used for designing the costumes and for collaborating with the scholars who would write descriptions of these that would explain the significance of them to the wider world. Can you tell us a bit about Cornelius Drebbel and Giordano Bruno then? Oh yeah, possible? Drebbel's great. I mean, um, we don't really know whether it was Archimbold or, or Drebbel who uh, supposedly invented a perspective lute, for example, which is a very interesting example of a sort of hybrid art and music combined, uh, supposedly with coloured tablature as well. But Drebbel was fascinating. He was very much involved with the court of James I in England as well. Um, Supposedly um, invented a submarine that went under the Thames, um, attracted the interest of Robert Boyle, father of English chemistry later. But Drebbel um, was of particular interest for Rudolf as an inventor. He was fascinated by perpetual motion machines. And um, Howard earlier mentioned 
um, these collections are artificialia as well as naturalia, and this is a wonderful example of a machine, perpetual motion, Drebbel invents, um, or, or does his best to invent uh, such things. He's also employed as someone knowledgeable about mineralogy and alchemy, the subject I love going back to. Um, so he's one example of an inventor and, and proto-scientist in a way. What Giordano Bruno, on the other hand, is... Um, I'd say far more mystical. I mean, okay, he's, he's a hermetist, he's interested in the ideas of Hermes Trismegistus, and I suppose the ideal earthly representative of that would be Rudolf in Prague. Um, uh, and he's also a Copernican, so he's very much a supporter of the heliocentric system of astronomy. He's um, a promulgator of the medieval art of memory. He had a prestigious memory, prodigious memory and um, promoted techniques for for um, using this and developing it on, uh, on an occult level. And some people have suggested that Rudolf's cabinets of curiosities are in some ways analogous to this art of... They're a memory system in themselves. Um, of course, most people remember Bruno because he was burnt at the stake in 1600 um, by the Inquisition. Um, for beliefs, for example, plurality of worlds uh, and other heretical scientific beliefs... Can so. I just ask, ask you, Howard, <coughs> there was a university in Prague, mm -hmm, yeah. uh, and there were universities all across Europe, yet Rudolf attra was attracting these people. And, uh, uh, um, what was he offering, his court, that the universities weren't providing? Well, at Charles University in Prague is a bit of a special case, because mm -hmm. in the aftermath of the Hussite revolt, Prague has, had been sort of uh, sealed off from the rest of Europe and not, uh, and not fully integrated, so it was in a, in a bad state. But the more general point is that universities were set up effectively to teach you know, the received heritage of, uh, 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 of, of the West and to pass it on to the next generation. They were not... Uh, remotely regarded as research I institutes. They weren't set up, they weren't founded, they weren't funded for that kind of thing. And if you wanted fun funding, um, salary in the first instance, you know, equipment and assistance in, in, in the second, um, to pursue natural philosophical inquiry uh, and, and, and to move back the frontiers of knowledge to change the accepted uh, uh, order of things. And you were not very independently wealthy, as of course Tycho Brahe was. Um, you, needed to find, uh, you needed to find a wealthy patron uh, to sustain at least some part of, of, of that inquiry. And the obvious concentrations of wealth and prestige were in the, in the courts of, uh, of Europe. Central Europe, of course, was divided into many individual territorial principalities, so it was very rich with this particular resource. Uh, Rudolf was, was at the summit of that system, uh, notionally for the whole of Europe and certainly for, for, for Central Europe. And uh, the other part of the equation is, of course, that um, it began to dawn on uh, uh, rulers in the Renaissance period that there was considerable prestige to be attached from being associated with uh, these collections, with the, with the kind of concentrations of knowledge and expertise, um, and also conceivably with the discoveries, whether mathematical, astrological, uh, or, 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 or whatever. So, so there was, a, there was a, um, an incentive for them to, to patronize scientists, what we would call today scientists, on the one hand, alongside artists on the, on the other. Just briefly, then, just the, the courts there, he doesn't do much building in, in Prague, doesn't any real building. He tries to bring Palladio over, and Palladio doesn't want to come, otherwise he would, <laughs> might have done a lot of building. But there had been great medieval building and early Renaissance building done before he got there. Mm. But inside his court, we're talking about laboratories, we're talking about uh, uh, him setting up a, a counter-university system. Let's turn, you mentioned Tycho Brahe, Adam Mosley, who at the end of the 16th century, he was a Danish nobleman, he was rich, he'd set up a, the, one of the great observatories, or the greatest was in, uh, at the time, uh, on, on Danish soil. He lost favour in Denmark and he eventually ended up in Prague. Uh, what did he bring uh, to Prague? Well, I think the biggest thing he brought to Prague was the Brahe brand, which he presented in the form of a... He represented the form of a magnificent book which described what his enterprise had been in Denmark. Um, and displayed some of the instruments, some of which he brought with him to Prague eventually, although he couldn't bring some of the largest and best instruments because they were fixed in situ uh, in his island observatory back in Denmark. Um, the project that he brought was a project to reform astronomy empirically. Tycho Brahe's was an observational project uh, he s was systematically observing the stars and the planets, and he was setting out, actually, to demonstrate um, uh, 
to produce with these, with, with these observations a new set of planetary models and to demonstrate that actually both Ptolemy and Copernicus were wrong and that the real account of the universe, mathematically and philosophically, was the Tychonic world system, the world system that he invented, um, which had the Earth at the center of the universe um, but had the planets rotating around the sun, which rotated around the Earth. Tycho also brought um, his alchemical expertise. And that was another one of the attributes that I think would have attracted Rudolf, as well, of course, his astrological yeah. expertise. These three things went together with Tycho. And although we tend to think of him, think of him as, as an astronomer particularly, that was partly because um, he made it clear that he felt it slightly improper to talk about um, alchemy, um, but he conveyed, cleverly conveyed, that he had plenty of alchemical secrets to convey to yeah. the emperor in person. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, the plans of Uraniborg in Denmark, his, his famous observatory, um, also had laboratories uh, uh, underground. Um, he's, he sent uh, Rudolf, um, I think when he was seeking patronage, one of his alchemical cures, which was meant to be better than, far better than gold for him. Uh, and this, this definitely would have been an attraction for Rudolf. And the astrology, I have to say, uh, it, it may horrify people to hear that, you know, he is one of the f most famous astronomers, but Rudolf employs him as his, his personal astrologer as well. I mean, and this is someone who's already had um, his horoscope done by Nostradamus when he was a child. Uh, you know, it is a fascination of the time, and uh, he's, he, uh, as someone who's observing the stars, um, Brehe is, is more qualified than most to do this. He's making very accurate can observations. I just, can I just turn to, as you brought up Rudolf's personality a little, we have, mm. we have, we have not talked about that yet. There isn't any Curious enough, there isn't any, an immense amount known about him as I understand. Let's find out what there is known about him. Um, do you want to start, uh, Howard? Can I just be prompted by Sir Philip Sidney, who was mm -hmm. the court in a letter to Francis Walsingham, our, our spy king at the time, who referred to him as a man of few words, sullen of disposition, very secret and resolute, extremely spaniolated. Well, that, that's what can we add to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that? That's part of the reason why, of course, we don't have as clear a picture of his personality as we might. He was very reserved. He was very taciturn. And particularly in his latter years, he was ex extremely with withdrawn. I mean, we can unpack spanulated a, a bit, which actually meant, meant extremely stiff, formal, mm. uh, 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 acutely aware of his own status, uh, status and rank, um, extremely dignified, but also, but also you know, ex extremely s stiff and, and formal. In, in he spent some of his youth at the court in Spain. He, he, Yes, that's right, plan. and that Uncle's was the main thought, yeah. that, that was the main thing he brought back with him. I mean, what he didn't bring back, and this is crucially important, I think, for understanding the natural philosophical as well as other aspects of his mm -hmm. of his reign, is is the ethos of the of the Counter Reformation, yeah, because exactly. there was simply no way of translating that from the the the, uh, the Spanish half of the uh, of the uh, of the Habsburg family to the Austrian half, because the political conditions were utterly different. He didn't have a consolidated state like Castile to make the center of his empire. He didn't have, he didn't have the ethos of of, of the Reconquista, 500 years of expelling the first the Moors and then the Jews uh, uh, from from uh, the Iberian Peninsula. And of course, he didn't have the the boatloads of, of of gold and silver coming in from the New World either to to, to finance a, an aggressive military campaign. Nor did he have the nor did he have, have the army. So he so he needed to find comp he needed to find. Uh, a, a way out of this 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 um, this trap which was building all of around him of his empire dissolving into equally antagonistic uh, confessional factions and part of the reason he then he he, he, he then ends up pat patronizing this remarkable work in the arts uh, broadly conceived including you know the arts of, of alchemy and astron astronomy shifting into into uh, uh, an interest in in the natural world is because here we have a a, a, a field of cultural um, significance and and crea creativity outside this uh, this fractious con confessional domain. So he's actually responding, in fact, very creatively to the confessional pressures of the uh, uh, of the year by shifting the center of gravity of his court in, yeah. in, in a rather different. Now that doesn't tell you much about his personality, but given that 
he has a reputation, particularly in his, his latter years, of of, uh, of of actually going mad, of actually sort of losing uh, losing uh, his grip. Um, this sh- suggests to me, I mean, a very a visionary and a very creative response to a, to an almost impossible situation, one which had been prepared by previous yeah. Habsburg emperor, emperors, particularly his father Maximilian II, mm-hmm. but which which um, which Rudolf epitomizes and pushes to a new level because it is the only way of escaping from this. This, this dilemma that he finds himself in. And you uh, think you're right about his character? Yeah, I mean, on. one, maybe, maybe I'm being slightly facile here, but uh, his, Rudolf's father had a reputation for being extremely liberal, um, uh, hence you've got this development of the Utraquists, the, the, the believers who tolerate both confessions, Protestant and Catholic. Um, maybe Rudolf is more that he can't stand either confession particularly, so um, he, he doesn't favour either, which gets him into a lot of trouble, of course, with the church. Well, he is, as they said, at the, as we said at the beginning mm. of the programme, he is trying to get God out of the equation, isn't he? I, I, I don't... He's trying to get the Catholic interpretation of God, perhaps, out of the equation. Um, uh, um, but he's... There's no doubt. I mean, he's attracting people who are extremely devout, extremely spiritual, but then performing practices that orthodoxy will automatically condemn as being diabolic. I don't know. I think it's very interesting to... People were surprised by Rudolf's behaviour. So, for example, when Tika Brahe first comes to court... He is very surprised that he gets to see the emperor all by himself. Yeah, they have yeah. a private conversation with no one else present. Mm. And Tycho is, is very flattered by that, but he says, you know, Rudolf was very pleased to see me. He was smiling a lot. I couldn't follow every word he said because he was very softly spoken. Mm. So even in a private audience with the mm. emperor, yeah. there was a mystery there. It was difficult to really, you know, follow everything that was going on. You must point out that he had he had great accomplishments. Like Elizabeth I, he spoke mm-hmm. several languages, he didn't have her he didn't have her talent for ruling, but he, he was very learned in, in that way and and quite egalitarian. I mean, I, OK, maybe this is just folklore, but supposedly he steps down off his throne, shakes hands with Tico, which is which is unusual. Uh, he gives, uh, I mean, he gives audience as well to. I mean, for example, uh, we mentioned very briefly at the beginning, John D. J- John D. Um, Who was the Magus at Elizabeth? The Magus at Elizabeth's court, court yeah. arrives there, uh, and also tutor of Sir Philip Sidney for a, for a while. Um, arrives there and gets audience in 1584 with Rudolf. And um, interesting, given the fact that they are both Cancerians' astrology, uh, D. Sh- might have been more tactful. He says um, the angel, the angel of the Lord has. Um, spoken to me and um, rebukes you for your sins. However, if you listen to me, you'll be okay and you'll overthrow the devil, uh, by which he understood the, the great Turk. Um, Rudolf was surprisingly okay about that. I mean, afterwards they had a conversation about scrying, conversations with angels and so forth. Um, but the, um, <laughs> the Roman, uh, the nuncio from Rome really disapproved of this and, and he in the end had to leave in a hurry. That's the other side of the equation to some extent because while he's giving remarkable uh, uh, um, receptions to, you know, traveling magi mm. and, uh, and, and artists and so on, uh, he's very often keeping even the most senior diplomats who are visiting his court, and they all had to visit, visit his mm. court, both because he wasn't sending very many ambassadors abroad, and also because for the last years of his life he didn't leave Prague. Mm. In fact, he didn't even leave his his, his castle on the on, on, on the Prague Hill for for uh, long long periods of time. So these ambassadors would come, you know, to do the absolutely urgent business of running Christendom, running the empire, running mm. running Hungary, uh, uh, Bohemia, the, the Austrian patrimonial lands, and he keep them waiting interminably while he's talking with Tycho Brahe. And, and, and John D. Yeah. Um, so that's the that's the other side of the coin. We can't. We um, we've got to bring in uh, Kepler. Um, uh, Tycho Brahe died in 1601. He'd brought in Johannes Kepler. Uh, what Kepler did was probably, well, arguably, the most significant thing that came out of this entire Prague court. So briefly, Adam Mosley, I'm sorry, it's briefly, but can you tell us about Kepler's three laws of planetary motion and why being at Prague enabled him to get to them? Well, Kepler, like Tycho, arrived in Prague um, against his will, initially. Um, he was forced out because of the Counter-Reformation from Graz and Styria. He came to Prague because he had an offer from Tycho. He needed an assistant to help him with his calculations. Um, there were some problems with their relationship, but eventually Kepler was in the right place at the right time to become Tycho Brahe's successor as imperial mathematician and have access to Tycho Brahe's data. And from that data, 
Kepler was able to pursue his project. His view had always been that Copernicus had demonstrated that the universe was sent on the sun, but he hadn't demonstrated why it was sent on the sun, or indeed why the planets had the particular positions that they had in that system. Um, through working through the problems um, of solving the, the planetary motions, of modeling them, which was the task he had to perform as imperial mathematician under Rudolf and his successors, he arrived at what we now think of as his, his laws of planetary motion. The first one, which it, from the, the point of view of the period would be the most revolutionary, would be that planets don't move in circles, they move in ellipses, mm. with the sun at one focus. The second laws are laws about... Um, uh, uh, that, that describe that motion further. So the second law is the law that if you draw a line from the sun to the planet, mm. it sweeps out equal areas in equal sp intervals of time. So that uh, tells you that the planet moves faster um, at one point in its orbit and slower at another point in its orbit. Uh, the third law, which he didn't appear in, in a later work that, than the, the previous two laws, um, and was buried a little bit in that work, is a law about the relationship between the periods of the orbits, how long they take, um, and the distance from the sun. And that was, became the basis of, uh, of, of scientific astronomy, in a way, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Well, but added on to what Copernicus had said. What happened to his court and his collection? He died in 1612, and, um, and this was his to be his great inheritance, yeah, not buildings, yeah. not an empire, uh, but um, his, his brothers got him out, uh, mm. he, he, and what happened to this enormous collection? It was really sad. Uh, Matthias, his uh, brother, uh, most competitive brother, yes, uh, had an inventory made. Um, uh, it's some of the possessions got um, shared between the other siblings, but the, the I suppose the main thing was that in the Thirty Years' War, uh, Queen Christina of Sweden, who was also a great collector of curiosities, um, her troops um, invaded Prague and swiped a lot of it, taking it to um, Sweden. Uh, so, so you can see a lot of Rudolf's collection in Sweden. A certain amount in Sweden, she uh, took uh, other bits with her on her travels, so they get scattered around, uh, and, and other bits get sold off by people who were less interested in collecting uh, and, and knowledge, really. Well, that's a bit of a sad end, isn't it, really? Well, it is, and it's, it takes place, to, to make it all the more poignant, it takes place in the last months of the war that's been going on for 30 years, yeah. when the peace negotiations in mm. Westphalia have already been going on for, for about five years, and yeah. the Swedish army retreating back to the north of Germany makes it makes a detour to Prague to make off with this, uh, yeah. what was supposed to be part of the, uh, the Habsburg patrimony. So there you are. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Adam Mosley, Peter Forshaw, and Howard Hudson. Uh, next week we'll be talking about the social contract, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Hugo Grotius, John Locke. Uh, thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.